Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. A legacy lives on through the South Sex Central Texas aviation community. It's been one year since a plane crash took the lives of two people from the greater San Antonio area. And since then, the families of Devin Riley and Zachary Kali Moreno have found ways to honor them. The night team's Avery Everett shows us how Zachary's family is planning to continue his legacy. Zach was always looking up at the sky. His dream was to fly, and the family of Zachary Coley Moreno says his focus was clear. He really felt like that was where he was supposed to be, and, and he was so happy doing it. But that all changed one year ago. Coley Moreno died in a plane crash in Wisconsin, along with pilot Devin Riley. They were visiting the area for an air show in Oshkosh. At only 20 years old, Colin Moreno was an aircraft mechanic and a member of the commemorative Air Force Central Texas Wing. What did flying mean to him? Mm. Oh, gosh. Everything. Yeah. His family worked with the commemorative Air Force to build a scholarship fund in his name. And in less than a year, they've raised more than $50,000 in donations. It was just cool to see so many people come from so many places and want to give something in Zach's name. The CAF hopes to award multiple scholarships in his memory, and students can now apply. Ideally, the, per the perfect candidate for the scholarship is going to be someone who's there because they want to be, not because they have to be. They just they want to do this, and that would make us and Zach very proud. His family hopes this scholarship will give students the chance to dream. Driving forward, Zach's love of flying to the future of aviation. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. So that application is open, but good news, there's no deadline on it yet for Zach's Memorial Scholarship. Now, we also reached out to Devin Riley's family, and they kindly declined a request for an interview. Her scholarship page is still up, and we have both of those links to both scholarships on KSAT.com. Stephanie F. Whoever gets that is going to be so special. Thank you so much for that, Avery. New on the night beat tonight, an inmate at the Bear County Jail has died. According to the sheriff's office, 46-year-old Michael Rosas was found unresponsive. Life-saving measures were performed, we're told, but they weren't successful. The sheriff's office says that Rosas' death appears to be the result of a medical episode. The Bear County Medical Examiner will determine the official cause of his death. One of our officers shot multiple times. We're learning more about the shooting of a San Antonio police officer. The officer was in her 20s. She was rushed to the hospital early yesterday after a shootout at the Icon Apartments on Patricia Drive. That's on the city's north side. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says that three officers were responding to a domestic violence call at that complex when a man fired a rifle. The chief says that the officers fired back and killed the 25-year-old man. One of the officers was hit multiple times and needed surgery. Now, we don't know the name of the officer who was shot. However, police are telling us that she has a long road to recovery. They're also telling us that tonight she's in good spirits. And while we're on that subject, if you or anybody you know is in a domestic violence situation, please know that there are plenty of places for you to get help here in town. So when you scan the QR code that you see there on your screen, that will direct you to a long list of resources. In other news tonight, it turns out the two teenagers who were arrested and charged with the murder of an 80 year old woman are actually brothers. One of them is in the Bear County Jail and this morning the other one was in the juvenile court. That one is 16 years old. We can't identify him at this point because he's a minor, but we do know that he was in front of a judge earlier today. He, along with his 19 year old brother, Jacob Rios, are accused of being in a shootout back in May. Maybe you remember the story, but police believe that the gunfire from that shooting is what struck and killed 80 year old Heidi Silkworth, who was attending a graduation ceremony or who was leaving a graduation ceremony at the Alamo Dome. Today, the 16 year old said that he didn't have a gun when that crime occurred and that he was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Meanwhile, his parents told the judge that they were shocked. Regardless of being an A student or not, you have a, a long road ahead of you. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. The teen wanted to be released and get GPS monitoring until he went on trial, but the judge said no. So the teen's going to be back in court in, in August. As for Rios, his brother, he remains in the Bear County Jail awaiting his first court hearing. 
Happening now, another day, another construction project to tell you about. The latest kicked off just a few hours ago on Wurzbach Road near the Medical Center. This one is specifically aimed at improving sidewalks and making bus stops more accessible along I-10 to Fredericksburg Road. The project is being carried out in four phases and should be finished by early next year. Now be sure to check out our traffic authority page on ksat.com. Again, scan that QR code on your screen. It'll take you to a full list of closures in and around San Antonio and also the detours that you can take. Important stuff because you can get prepared ahead of time. The camera was on red, that means I'm live. I cannot move and I was just there feeling him behind me. So I was, it was for me an eternity. While volunteering at her church, the woman you just heard from says that she was the victim of inappropriate touching. The man she's accusing, Leon Valley City Councilman Benny Martinez, has been accused of this before. Tomorrow night on the Night Beat, that woman sits down with Patty Santos and tells us why she came forward with her story. Again, that's going to be tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Meanwhile, big day up in Austin. That's where President Joe Biden spoke at the LBJ Presidential Library. The president was there to mark 60 years since the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Steve Spreester was there in Austin today and has more. President Joe Biden here to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. What better place than the LBJ Library to commemorate a act that was perhaps the cornerstone, the highlight of the LBJ administration. And while he was here at the library's auditorium, he not only talked about civil rights, he also talked about linking it to the United States Supreme Court and about how in his vision, this current Supreme Court is dismantling many of the things LBJ got passed 60 years ago. The very idea that we're all created equal deserve to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that, but we've never walked away from it. We've never walked away because leaders like Lyndon Baines Johnson. The reforms that the president would like to see of the Supreme Court is 18 year terms, some accountability for the justices. He also wants a constitutional amendment that basically says that no president is above the law. There is not all encompassing immunity. Now, as far as the Civil Rights Act, the president says what it has done and what it continues to do, he hopes, is to ensure that all Americans are treated equally. He says it's not lost on him, that he was the vice president of the first black president, and he's also the president for the first black female vice president. And he hopes that's a legacy that continues. But he was also very clear when it comes to civil rights, there's still work to do. In Austin at the LBJ Library, Steve Spreester, KSAT 12 News. He mentioned that there's still work to do plenty of times. Now, after the president was in Austin, he went up to Houston to pay his respects to the late representative Sheila Jackson Lee, who's lying in state at Houston City Hall. Jackson Lee lost her battle to pancreatic cancer back on July 19th. She was just 74 years old. Now let's go to your night beat news flash tonight. The bipartisan task force investigating the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump has been named. We know seven Republicans and six Democrats are going to be on the House task force, which will have subpoena power. The group's findings are going to be released on December 13th. JetBlue is leaving, saying bye-bye to San Antonio for good. The airline making that announcement just three years after launching nonstop flights to JFK Airport in New York City and Logan International Airport up in Boston. The airline has not yet said why it's leaving San Antonio International. However, airport officials say that it has nothing to do with its popularity in South Texas. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. I've been able to travel all over the world and progress uh, to where I am now, which is I'm going to Paris next month to the Paralympics. Love that story. You're going to want to cheer on Jason Tabansky as he heads to Paris for his first Paralympic Games. The U.S. Army veteran is from Bernie. Tiffany Huertas brings you Jason's inspiring story. It's streaming right now on KSAT Plus and all of our platforms. Please check it out. You'll be very happy once you do. 
Just a heads up, when you turn on GMSA next Monday, you're going to see a familiar face, a lovely face, Jaffany Gray. She's back. She's going to go co-host GMSA weekday mornings from 5 to 7, along with traffic anchor RJ Marquez and meteorologist Justin Horn. And then Jaffany's going to be back. She's going to join Stephanie Cerna and Justin Horn for GMSA at 9 o'clock. You can read more about Good Morning San Antonio right now on KSAT.com. But we still want you to stick around because, you know, at this time last week, we were getting ready for tons of rain. Fast forward to today and some parts of the KSAT 12 viewing area still dealing with the impact from that flooding. Next on the night feed, we're going to take a look at some of the problems that people in Kerrville are dealing with right now. And the aquifer is actually up over eight feet in 10 days because of that rainfall. It's more of a typical summertime pattern, but that also means dust and potential tropical development we'll get to in just a bit. Finally, a local community could get answers about concerns that neighbors have had over recycling and salvage yards. The city of San Antonio is creating a task force to review two codes that deal with violations and also citations from metal recyclers. The first community meetings are going to be this week. The first one's going to be tomorrow night at 530. The city is going to have a virtual meeting. That's the virtual one. And then at 530 on Wednesday, the city is going to have the same meeting, but in person. We have more details for you on KSAT.com. You know who can't forget about all the rain we've had in the last week? People up in Kerrville. That city still recovering from flooding in that area. As the night team's John Paul Barajas reports, last week's rain event is something that just doesn't happen often. Video shows the floodwaters that overwhelmed Kerrville's Luis Hayes Park that sits along the Guadalupe River last Tuesday. Nearly a week later, there's a drastic difference in the view. I've seen the river probably at its lowest it's ever been. So just to see it that low one day and then the next brimming to the top of the bridge, it was just unbelievable. According to the KSAT 12 weather team, Kerrville got as much as seven inches of rain. Public Works Executive Director Stuart Barron calls it a five to ten year rain event, something the city hasn't seen in six years. We have an idea of the damages that the city has felt, whether that was city property or just residents. I don't have a good number for residential type property on the city side. A lot of what ours was was cleaning up debris. Barron tells us all things considered, Kerrville managed well, but there is still work to be done, like cleaning and clearing storm drains and removing debris like this tree stuck on the dam. So we really enjoy having the river run through our city and uh, these floods are just part of having that, you know, and so you you just learn to live with it. The upside, Aaron says the springs are recharged and the river is flowing at double the rate it typically would this time of year, something that makes the water more enjoyable for all visitors, including wildlife. Well, and I don't think many people got hurt, uh, nobody that I know personally, um, so I think I mean, through my perspective, at least, it was more of a blessing, you know? We really needed the water. It's just good to see the river full again when I'm going to work. <laughs> John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, and that's the thing. We do need, we do need that. Now, I hope that people, I know that you hope people aren't complaining as much this week because we've had a nice respite. We've had a break, and now... Yeah. Back to typical summer temperatures. Yeah, back to s typical summertime weather in general, which mm -hmm. also means some Saharan dust headed our way, and we're looking at the potential for some tropical development. But the main headline is sunny, dry days with high temperatures in the mid to upper 90s. And that's about average for this time of year. Rain chances are on the low end, and that's not until we get to Sunday and Monday. It's only at about 20%. Noticeable dust plume arrives on Wednesday. Let's get right to it. Take a look at our rain chances. As I mentioned, only 20% Sunday and Monday. So it's a good thing we had such a great stretch of rain. Over the last 10 days, the aquifer is up eight and a half feet. And now, not just for the month of July, but for the entire year, we are above average in terms of rainfall at San Antonio International. We're actually above average year to date by 1.03 inches. Not going to leave out that three hundredths of an inch. Anytime we have a surplus, I like to brag about it a little bit. Here's our overall pattern, and you can see the showers and storms popping up northern Mexico, moving to Arizona and New Mexico. That's because they're on the edges of the heat high of the upper level high. The big blue H, which is back. 
back again. It's going to stick around for a while. Notice how it's going to be the primary driving force for the next several days. It will move westward a little bit, opening the door for a disturbance, but I just don't see any good disturbances or ripples in the flow to move our way and generate showers and storms. Only a 20% chance Sunday into Monday of a few of those pop-up showers that could develop. You look at the overall potential rainfall and we're back to having this bit of a donut hole right over Texas and especially our area. Yeah, East Texas, Northeast Texas could get hit as usual. They often see more than we do anyway, but the primary precipitation is going to be up in the Northland and the East Coast, all the way down to Florida and other parts of the Gulf Coast around here. We're just a little too close to that upper level high. We look to the tropics for potential development this time of year, and you see this really weak looking cluster of thunderstorms. Pretty wimpy right now, not a big deal. But that little disturbance, that ripple in the flow is going to be moving to the Northwest toward the Caribbean and the Bahamas in the coming days with the 40 to 60% chance of developing into the next tropical system. So that's what we'll be watching. It's going to be, it's going to take some time if anything develops, but it's the next system that uh, could potentially turn into something, a tropical depression or even a tropical storm. We'll see. Saharan dust, noticeable plume right now, right over the Gulf of Mexico. This is that really hazy dust that gives us the vibrant sunrises and sunsets. And that's the main thing you're going to notice from it. But notice first thing Wednesday morning, it's overhead, especially San Antonio, Austin, eastward to the Gulf Coast. And you'll notice that extra haze Wednesday and Thursday, but then it clears out by Friday and into the upcoming weekend, not nearly as hazy. So tomorrow we'll have the, mor the morning clouds. We're used to that. That's a typical weather pattern this time of year. The low clouds early in the morning, they break apart a bit, and then we have a lot of sunshine in the afternoon. 78 degrees at 7 a.m., 96 the high, and a noticeable southeasterly wind at 10 to 20. That's our average wind this time of year. 101 Del Rio tomorrow, Catula, 100 Crazel Springs 101. Really not bad, all things considered, being the end of July, especially compared to this time last year and this time the year before. You know what? This time two years ago, we had 49 100 degree days. Whoa. Yeah, right now we have 12, and we don't have any in the forecast. So really, we're close to average. The average high being 96, and soon rising up to 97 in August, which is climatologically speaking, the warmest time of the year. Got a nice view out there right now on live cam. Just keep in mind, it's going to be a little more hazy Wednesday and Thursday. All right, cool. The view is going to be a little rough tomorrow over at Dallas Cowboys, uh, the, the training camp, because the gloves are off, so to speak, yes. and the pads are on, and that hard hitting is about to begin. Stephanie, rough is the perfect way to put mm -hmm. it. It's, it's going to get a little nasty tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And our Larry and Mary, of course, are out there at training camp. They're excited to see how it's all going to be going when the hitting starts getting going. They got a full breakdown of what they've learned so far at camp. You're not going to want to miss that. Plus, a suspension for Houston Texan came down today. We're going to explain what happened right after the break. Welcome back to Oxnard, California, everybody. As we continue to cover Dallas Cowboys training camp, I'm Larry, she's Mary. So the Cowboys were off today. Mary, before I get into that a little bit more, what are your early impressions of camp? Camp's great. It's just starting to get really interesting, so I can't wait for what's ahead this week. All right, so the Cowboys are off today. It sounds like it's needed because head coach Mike McCarthy told us the other day the Cowboys are on an 11-hour schedule, and he said an intense schedule at that. Now, it's also part of the CBA, so the Cowboys do get a day off, but still, their bodies probably still need some time to recover. But we sat down and talked with wide receiver Jalen Tolbert and asked him about that 11-hour schedule. This morning, I woke up uh, about 6. 20 when it worked out uh, got a lift in before we had a team meeting at 7 30 uh, and then after that you go through meetings you come out here practice you know have maybe an hour or so to kind of shower ice bath do whatever you need to do before and then go back to meetings and then from meetings we come back out here and honestly i say it's even longer than 11 hours just because from here now you know you got to go take care of your body you got to sure. prep you got to do the things that you're going to do to get ready for the next day you know go get in the playbook go go take care of the body do what you got to do and so uh I say it's more about 13, 13 and a half, 14 hour day, but it's worth it, man. It's worth it. 
Well, Mary, if you want to make it in the NFL, those long hours are certainly necessary. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, sticking with the receiving core, there's obviously a gaping hole at camp with the absence of C.D. Lamb, yeah. who is holding out for contract-related reasons. So Mike McCarthy says the veteran presence of Brandon Cooks, who has been in the NFL for a little over a decade, is, quote, priceless. You can't put a price tag on it. I mean, it's definitely something that uh, you, you want through throughout your whole locker room and Brandon is a, is a tremendous example of that uh, and really has been since day one. Uh, I don't know if I've seen too many too many guys uh, that walk in here you know from another team that 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 really had the the respect you know of the locker room. I mean both him and Stefan last year were, were exceptional in that area so yeah it's I uh, can't have enough of it and it's and it's really cool to see him give back and and uh, really help these younger receivers. Well, Cooks has played for five different NFL teams, so I can't imagine what advice he's able to give the young receivers from Larry. And I can only imagine that those young receivers have to be like sponges when yeah. they talk to Brandon Cooks as he definitely Absolutely. knows what he's talking about. Okay, so the Cowboys will put on the pads tomorrow for the very first time since reporting the training camp. Mary, what are you expecting? Oh, position battles to completely ramp up, and some of the guys who have been um, injured, battling back from injuries to start ramping up their activity. It's going to be absolutely awesome. I love when they put the pads on because yeah. that's when things just <laughs> go up another notch or two. Awesome job, Mary. I appreciate it. All right, let's send it back to KSAT 12 and Nick Mantis, who has the Houston Texans covered for you. Well, thank you, Larry and Mary. The, uh, there was a lot of news out of Houston this afternoon. Let's start with the bad news. Newly acquired defensive end Danico Autry has been suspended six games for violating the NFL's policy against performance enhancing substances. Autry claims that his doctor submitted a prescription for a medical medication that contained a bad, banned substance but he accepts the punishment. The good news is another new addition. Mario Edwards is ready to step up if needed during the suspension, and he loves his new team. It's been good, man. Uh, you know, I love it here, and uh, they've been making it feel real home, and this would be great for me. I'm three hours away from home, so this would be a good place to kind of just settle down and call home. It's good, man. You have veteran guys that's been doing it for a while, so we can, you know, teaching guys. We put them along after practice, teaching them moves, teaching them how to take care of their bodies, and just teaching them all along how to be a professional. And we're going up one, against one of the best offenses in the league, so if we can penetrate it, we can execute and make plays against them, it's going to be fun on Sunday. I just see myself as, man, wherever coach needs me to go and make a play and make it happen, I, I'm willing to do it and ready to go do it. And in just a couple days, you'll see the Texans take on the Chicago Bears in the Pro Football Hall of Fame game. It's going to be on Thursday night, 7 p.m., right here on KSAT 12. Well, coming up after the break, we're talking hoops. Some breaking news for a Spurs rookie and how the U.S. women's basketball team did today. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. Some San Antonio Spurs news that we kind of knew was coming. The Spurs signed second-round draft pick Harrison Ingram to a two-way deal, meaning it'll split some time between Austin and San Antonio developing his craft in the G League. And a couple of weeks ago, he told us that that's fine with him. I mean, I'm happy to be here. Whatever it takes, whether it's G League, um, stay on the main team, whatever it is, I mean, I'm ready to do it to achieve my dreams. You know, a lot of times people come in and you get drafted, you want the draft picks on the team, people think it's all about scoring, and it's not all about scoring. It's about screening to get people open, I mean, knocking out open shots on defense, you know, talking, uh, being in the right spot. I mean, it's not all about the flashy plays. I mean, some of the plays that aren't on the box sheet, on the box score sheet, or don't show up in the highlights, you know, are just as important as those highlights and as those main shots. And in the Olympic Games, the United States women's basketball team had their debut today and beat Japan 102 to 76. Every single player on the USA team scored a bucket in this game as Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart led the way with 20 plus points each. The women will face Belgium on Thursday at 2 p.m. and the U.S. men will take on South Sudan Wednesday at 2 p.m. And tomorrow morning, Victor Wembanyama will face France or for France will face Japan at 10 15 a.m. and that's right where I'm going to be on my couch right there just watching, watching Wendy I, I, I'm sure you have monitors all over yeah it's it's a it's a, a thing that my fiance and I are talking about we're getting we're maybe you'll get it down to one monitor a busy time for it you. is all right thank you you're welcome and we'll be right back after this <laughs> 12 100 degree days so far this year and that's a Number I like to be at compared to this time last year 33 and then 49 this time two years ago. Wow. In other words, no complaining about the heat. Have a great night. Thank you for staying.